our investors are right now trying to position themselves for uh, more growth in ASEAN going forward. And I think that within ASEAN, we're seeing an awful lot of growth from, believe it or not, uh, the VIP countries. And this is Vietnam, and Indonesia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And this has become sort of the, uh, the three most interesting countries for all of our membership. So uh, as uh, ASEAN looks to the AEC and looks to try and resolve some of the non-tariff measure problems and some of the other problems of AEC, uh, our members uh, are now looking to uh, increase their uh, membership, their not membership, but their investment uh, and their trade with all of the ASEAN countries, but particularly those three that I mentioned. I think that the big opportunities are going to be coming well, one of the big opportunities is going to be infrastructure. And I know here in the Philippines, this is a very big deal. Uh, the 10-point program that uh, the President, President Duterte has uh, uh, introduced is very attractive to many of our members, particularly the infrastructure portion. If he can get 5% you know, or 7% of GDP, GDP coming out in infrastructure investment, this is going to be not only a tremendous boon for uh, the growth in the Philippines, but it will also mean a lot of good business for our firms and for a lot of firms here in the region. Ambassador, in a sense, that is a test case for the entire region. I mean, even the ADB was talking about doubling infrastructure exactly. spending to really meet the growth demands. Now, you focus on a region that has over 630 million people, $2.4 trillion in GDP. Uh, there are asymmetries, though, among countries, and I'm mm. sure your investors want to see some commonalities uh, in terms of improving the investment environment. What would you like to see in the Philippines in terms of it positioning itself better for the FDI, especially coming from your member companies? Well, I think the one of the the first things that we would like to see is in the 10-point plan, they're talking about raising the, the ownership limits on foreign direct investment. This would be enormous for the Philippines and for our companies. I know that many of our companies would like to do more in terms of investment here, particularly in the agriculture area, but they really feel that they need to be in more control of their own investment. So they would like to see those caps raised significantly. So that would be the first thing that I would do. Some of the other things is uh, any kind of streamlining of bureaucratic procedures. Uh, the Philippines legal system is uh, not noted for speed, so I think that uh, some manner, uh, something that would, that would help... Uh, the ease of doing business type. Ease yeah. of doing business, well, actually yes, and the ease of doing business has been uh, going up here in the Philippines. Let's talk about outward investment from the U.S. Mm. I mean, you know, you've got a Trump administration now. Right. There's been concerns about, uh, you know, uh, protectionist policies, but then you've got that yellow interest rate hike uh, right. possibly in March. Talk to us about how does that affect outward foreign direct investment from your firms? Have you heard anything from your firms in terms of changing their plans or evolving them over time? Uh, actually, no. I mean, what we're hearing from our investors, uh, from our investors, from our membership, is that um, they were very disappointed in... Uh, in the fact that we're not uh, more actively involved in the TPP process right now. At the same time, uh, we think that there are going to be, uh, there's going to be many other opportunities for trade liberalization and we are focusing on those opportunities. Now, in terms of outward investment, there has been a lot of talk in terms of uh, border taxes and this kind of thing. First of all, I think we've got to see what actually eventuates. We still don't know. So about there's pronouncements and there's policy. Exactly, and and there is, um, there are measures that we want to go into effect, and there are measures which, depending on international agreements and depending on our, our own domestic law, can go into effect. So how all these things are going to be in in play is going to be very important. What I'm hearing from most of my investors, my, my members, is that they're going to let economic factors determine how they're going to invest. Well, certainly more nuanced picture, and that's something your investors and members are looking at. Now, finally, I mean, you're, you're, uh, the U.S. ASEAN Business Council comprises cross-sections of industries. You're looking Absolutely. at manufacturing, technology, agriculture, as you mentioned, yes. even energy, and, then, and even finance. Talk to us about which sectors you feel is getting a little more buzz in terms of the way they're looking at ASEAN in the Philippines in particular. Well, the real buzz these days is in what we call the digital digital economy, and that cuts across all sectors. Whether you're talking about payment systems in the banking sector, talking about uh, smart farming in the agriculture sector, you're talking about balancing and uh, operating uh, coal-fired power plants more efficiently by using the Internet of Things in the energy sector, all of these things are going to be dependent on the digital economy. So we're looking very carefully at the new, uh, the new uh, department that's been sent up, the Department of ICT here. As you know, this is a wonderful place. It's always more fun in the Philippines, but... <laughs> you pick uh, it up as well. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you, you've also got the most expensive Internet in the world and one of the slowest Internets in the world. So um, one, of the, one of the things I remember that President Duterte said is he wanted to double the speed and half the cost. I'm waiting for him to do that.